Great to be with you. Peter Barlas here, cardiologist. Now, we've had some great feedback on that last video, part one on stent thrombosis. And as I mentioned, it's one of the more serious complications that you can have as a result of having a heart stent or several stents. Fortunately, it's uncommon, but it no doubt does happen. And obviously, the major issue with stent thrombosis is that the stent can block off very suddenly, putting you at risk of having a heart attack. So in part two, I want to focus on some of the factors that are relevant to the stent itself and the type of blockage that we're fixing that may put you at higher risk of developing stent thrombosis. So in part one, we focused on the patient factors that contribute to why somebody might be at risk of developing this complication. Now I want to focus on some of the stent factors and the procedural factors. Now many of these, if not the majority, are beyond your control, beyond the patient's control, but they are pretty much in the control of the cardiologist, the interventional cardiologist. So these are procedural factors that we need to be very meticulous in how we implant these stents and how we achieve success to ensure that we can maintain long-term excellent outcomes for our patients. But there are several things we need to focus on during the procedure that we need to reduce as interventional cardiologists to minimize the risk. So let's focus a little firstly on the stent factors. Now there are various stents available and pretty much modern day stents have very much similar uh, results and outcomes. They are very, very good stents. While the first generation of these stents, the drug eluting stents, were introduced back in the early 2000s, about 2003, 2004. And we used to see that if we were implanting those stents, there was a slightly higher risk of thrombosis developing as a result of a very unusual and rare type of allergic reaction to a material that was found on the polymer. Now a polymer is a lining or a piece of plastic that sits on the outside of the metal and which remains a drug. And that drug is released over the course of three to six months, which inhibits your body's response to developing a, an aggressive you know, scar formation inside. Well, that polymer, which acts like a carrier, was triggering off some allergic reactions and that was causing stent thrombosis. And I've published a case on that back many years ago where we aspirated or we sucked out some of the clot that was in a patient's artery that got to us in time. And we actually found in that clot that there were several of these allergic type cells or eosinophils. And that points to the fact that there was some reaction, some allergic reaction like you might get with you know, asthma or eczema whereby the body suddenly developed this complication as a result of this allergic reaction. Now, we are not placing any of those stents now in modern day medicine. Uh, all our stents have evolved and have changed and become more refined and far more safer. But certainly if you had one of the older or the first generation stents placed in the early 2000s, then of course there is a slightly higher risk of developing this complication. And your doctor will no doubt have considered that and have had you on appropriate you know, medication and follow up long term. Another stent factor is if you have multiple overlapping stents. If you need to cover a long segment of disease or blockage and you're putting multiple stents in, well particularly when you have one stent in the other, then you can imagine there are essentially two layers of stent that are overlapping. Well we know that that is a slightly higher risk of developing stent thrombosis longer term. In some stents, and particularly if it's a long stent that's been used to treat a long blockage, and you can imagine with the repetitive motion of our heart and the arteries, then there might be a complication that is called stent fracture. We've had a separate video on what stent fracture is, but again, it's a relatively uncommon complication, but with repetitive motion, there is fatigue that develops within the metallic part of the stent, and over time, that breaks. And that can also contribute to stent thrombosis. Now, I want to also discuss now some of the 
procedural factors. And these are beyond your control, and these are really in the control of the interventional cardiologist that's placing the stent. But there are certain procedural factors that we are aware of, and we try to mitigate when we're performing percutaneous coronary intervention to ensure that our patients have long-term safety and an excellent quality of life. But we know that if the stent is not expanded appropriately in the artery, then that can be a risk for stent thrombosis. Now, what does that mean? Let me give you an example. Say your artery is four or five millimeters in diameter and it contains a severe blockage. Well, we have to ensure that we place the appropriate stent that will fit that diameter artery. So it's not only looking at the length of stent that we need to use, but the diameter is crucially important because we know that if you were to put a slightly smaller stent, like a three millimeter or a 3.5 millimeter stent in a larger artery, well, you can imagine there is a mismatch. And that mismatch means that bits of the stent are not attached to the vessel wall. They are floating within the artery. And that is a potential problem for where little blood cells and platelets can actually clump onto the metal that is visible and cause stent thrombosis. So that's an important procedural factor. And the way we get around that is we expand our stents appropriately using high pressure balloons after we've put the stent in. So it's not just a simple procedure where we, you know, in and out and put a stent in. It's a matter of optimizing and customizing that stent to fit your particular artery to ensure that we get long lasting results. If there is a small tear or dissection after we've put the stent, and we know that it's common to have a small little tear in the lining of the artery when we've put a stent in, and in the majority of cases they're very, very tiny, and they actually heal on their own within the matter of days and weeks. Well, if, however, we don't recognize that there is a more significant tear, and you can imagine we put a stent in and it causes some trauma at the bottom part of the stent, then that causes this dissection, this little tear. And if it's significant and not managed with another stent or not treated appropriately, then that itself can be a risk for developing stent thrombosis. Now, I want to focus on several of the lesion factors, and these are the factors that are caused by the particular blockage that you have in your artery. And the key is, where is this blockage? So having blockages in these branch points or bifurcation lesions, we know, puts you at slightly higher risk of developing stent thrombosis. So bifurcation lesions, we often try to minimize the number of stents and try to manage them simply with what we call a provisional strategy where we put one stent in. But if we need to use multiple stents to expand and open up the blockage in both the main vessel and the side branch, well then we know that there is a slightly higher risk of stent thrombosis. We know that if you have a lot of calcium in the wall of the artery that's causing the blockage, and if there's a lot of calcium, sometimes when we put a stent in, the calcium is quite rigid and quite hard. It's like a rock material, and that prevents us from expanding or making sure that the stent is appropriately sized. So having calcium is also another factor that can put you at a high risk of developing stent thrombosis. If you're having a stent to treat an old stent that has failed, so putting a new stent in a previous area of what we call restenosis. So if you've had an old stent and it's blocked off and we're putting another stent, well, that also slightly increases our risk of developing long-term stent thrombosis. And nowadays, the majority of these blockages that occur within old stents or re-narrowing inside old stents, we try to manage them with some special types of balloons called drug coated balloons or drug eluting balloons. Then these balloons have got a particular drug that is expressed into the artery, into the old stent, and really helps to give us a longer term result rather than it closing down and rather than us needing to put another stent inside. So you've seen that there are many factors that are beyond the patient's control. And obviously these are factors that the cardiologist 
themselves is considering. And that's what we do. That's what we train for to ensure that we can reduce all these risks. But these risks and complications can happen. Not having a stent expanded, if there's a dissection or a little tear that remains in the artery after the stent has gone in, if you're putting multiple stents in or long stents, there's always this risk. So we've got to always look at trying to reduce the risk, control the factors that we can. So as, as cardiologists, making sure that we're getting excellent results for our patients. In many cases, using what we call intracoronary imaging or looking inside the artery and inside the stent with certain types of cameras with ultrasound or light called OCT. And these imaging methods give us a little bit more information about how the stent is performing and what the result is after the stent. So we can really reduce the risks of developing this complication. And of course, addressing the patient factors, making sure we stop smoking, making sure we control diabetes, making sure that we're compliant with the medication that you're de prescribed by your cardiologist. Really, these are all key factors that we can ensure we reduce the risk of you developing this complication and can lead a active, fulfilling life without the fear of developing this complication. Thanks again for joining me. Until the next video, bye for now.